So we have to thank really the gentleman for being here. We have to thank Lucia about the lecture he's going to give his presentation. It's going to be really very interesting. The topics are really fascinating. Things are changing so quickly that for us to have the vision of something with its relevance and experience is something very important. In the structure of this of this act, he will have the journal will have a presentation, and after of course we we expect and we hope from all of you a very fruitful debate. So get ready to make the questions we all expect. So I think that now John is going to introduce. A estimado vicepresidente de CESA, estimado director de comunicación de redes sociales, amigos y amigas, eh, es un placer estar hoy aquí con motivo de este sismo de Arsenia. Eh, ya sabéis que los sismos de Arsenia son unos eventos que se realizan a nivel de fundación, eh, que nos permiten abordar temas relevantes al sector y de algo que nos hablan de son las empresas que conforman la fundación para la sostenibilidad energética y ambiental. Eh, por eso lo primero es agradecer a todas las empresas patronas lo que es su colaboración y compromiso en la organización de estos eventos y en el evento de hoy especialmente agradecer a CESA lo que es eh, la participación y o, en la organización de este evento. Agradecimiento que quisiera hacer este sismo todo el equipo de CESA que durante estos últimos meses ha trabajado conjuntamente de forma intensa para hacer que hoy podamos tener a este excelente ponente con todos, con todos nosotros. Sin más demora, para mí es un placer presentar a nuestro ponente de hoy, Mr. John Cooper. Thank you very much, John, for your great amability to participate in this session of CERNA. Mr. Cooper will address the end of his presentation on the situation of the downstream activities in Europe, and more precisely, how to balance environmental and competitiveness objectives. It is indeed a topic of great relevance given that the climate objectives need to be balanced with the rest of the European Union objectives to maintain competitiveness and investment opportunities in the sector. As you might know, since April 2015, the John Cooper is the Director, General Director of Fields Europe and Concower, an institution that aims to promote at economic and environmental level sustainable refining, supply and use of petroleum products in the European Union by providing input and respect advice to the European institutions, member state governments, and the wider community. Field Europe represents the interest of 42 companies operating with finance in Europe, with account for the total petroleum refining capacity and more than 75% of the European motor fuel retail sales. Field Europe, Europe is also a key player in the oil sector, contributing in a constructive and proactive way to the development and implementation of the European policies and regulations. We are certainly, John, uh, honored to have such an expert today to address this very important issue that brings us together. Thanks again for accepting your invitation, John, and without more delays, the floor is yours. Yes, sure, thank you. If you don't mind, I will stand up. Um, also, it's uh, often because I will uh, walk and uh, show the slides. Um, first of all, can I just say it's, uh, it's a great privilege for me to, uh, to come and speak to Fonseca today. Uh, I've uh, spoken now three or four times in, in Madrid in the last couple of years. What I find very exciting is that the conversation in Spain is dynamic, it's mature, it draws on such deep experience, uh, but it's progressive. And we always have so many good experts in the room. So I think it's, it's for me, it's very really enjoyable, but it also feels as if we're really making progress with getting some alignment about the life of this form. So uh, it's yeah, uh, exciting. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Um, I've got to mind if I should tell anyone. Okay. Does that work? So, um, I'll move into some slides. Uh, just before I start talking about this subject, uh, being a visiting Brit, there is just one other thing I should maybe make a remark about, and that is uh, um, we have an interesting movie playing in the UK right now. It's a comedy, uh, it's called Brexit the Movie. Um, we're not quite sure how it ends yet, um, but it has some very bad jokes uh, along the way. Um, it hasn't played out, and quite seriously, there's a vote, and there's an expectation of an action that comes soon, but the politics by the hour is developing into a different set of issues. 
and it's quite possible that the end result is not the one we thought last Friday. I really don't know how to predict that we've got a battle for leadership in politics in the, in the UK right now. In not one party, but two main parties. And it's very difficult to see how that ends. But what is clear, and just come forward a little bit away from the speaker, what is clear is that the real questions that are facing the, the electorate are not really ones directly connected with membership in the European Union. And so I think there's a, some more chapters to come. So it may not be one movie, it may be several in sequence. Uh, I, I apologise for the pain that the UK is putting to the rest of Europe right now. Um, please be patient with us. Anyway, I put my other hat on to represent uh, Fuel Zealand today. And the conversation title that I've chosen really here is about downstream oil and the, the climate policy in Europe. And how do we balance environmental and competitiveness objectives? Uh, can I just take, do we need the microphone for the camera? Because I don't think I need it. Sorry, it's very good. Yeah. Without. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so you don't mind. Um, because this is all a bit more natural. We we start with a picture of uh, obviously the refinery with all the different products that we use in the program for. And uh, I've always said this, but in this group I will certainly say. You know, petroleum is an incredible gift of nature. It has enabled so much in human development and still does. And much of the world is now looking forward to economic development and improvement in standard of living. And they factor in continued use of petroleum for that. And the fact that it's come down from $120 to $50 just makes it an incredible bargain. And if we take away the tax and the other distortions, you know, to, to be able to fill your car for 15 euros and travel from one side of Europe to the other. It's an incredible bargain. And we have um, technology and uh, our industries, the motor industry and petroleum, to thank for that. And it's difficult for us to see how do we rapidly move away from that. And that's my starting point in this whole conversation. Um, that we bring a great deal to society. We also understand the negatives. We understand there's a significant one around climate. And then there's also uh, additional ones around air quality that we need to think about. But I do believe that there are cost-effective answers to those, and we've got to find the right policy mix. So let's uh, just start off. I think Fuel Zero, Brian uh, has already given us a, a brief introduction. I'll just say a couple of words about that. Refresh what we have said as an industry association on energy and climate change. Then we'll talk about two big themes, competitiveness and then the future role of in transport, actually. We think we should talk about the two together because we won't get much traction for the idea of maintaining a competitive downstream sector if you don't believe we'll need our products in the future. People are just saying, we don't care. And actually, that's pretty much where the coal industry is right now. They are in a somewhat similar position, but with some really important differences. We'll talk about that later. So let's just say Fuel Zero uh, represents 41 member companies, and that is 100% petroleum refining. Uh, the association actually is Fuel Zero and Konkari. And Konkari is the science organization. It fulfills a number of important functions, not the least of which is compliance with the REACH regulation. Uh, you will see across the members there some quite diverse business models. We've got a couple of the members that have invested quite heavily in biofuels. Uh, Nestle and Cree have both done quite a lot around biofuels. Several other companies have got some smaller activities around biofuels. Um, uh, BP Shell, um, I think one or two others, uh, Lion Del Bazaar. Uh, and so there's some mix there. You notice that we've now got Gunvor as a member in the association, clearly strongly based with, with trading as a core business model, but also now have the funding partly integrated into that. That is, that is a change in the competitive landscape. And also potentially the regulatory interests and, uh, um, and maybe some sorts of some tensions, I don't know, in the industry, we'll see it, certainly in the association. We have Luke Oil, um, and we will likely also soon have, as a member, Rosneft, because Rosneft have uh, done a capacity swap with BP, and will have majority ownership of, uh, of one in time. And so the membership, continues to evolve. Uh, SR, of course, is an um, Indian-owned company as well. 
What do we cover? We cover the downstream which is refining and transport, um, things like barge safety and issues like that, and marketing issues, fuel grades, etc. Uh, that's our activity. Our policy position on energy and climate change. We feel it's necessary to set this out regularly to our audiences, in particular in Brussels, because we want to be clear that we see ourselves as part of the range of solutions rather than part of the problem. We've been very clear that we recognize climate change as a global challenge requiring global action. Some carefully chosen words there, it's a global challenge, it's not a local or a regional challenge. And the solutions absolutely have to be global. We have supported the COP21 Paris Agreement, we've come out with press releases around that. And one of the key points out of our position on this is we support a way of putting a price on carbon globally. We also believe that this objective needs to be balanced. Europe has been through some very difficult times, and many parts of Europe are still in difficult times. Uh, we've lost jobs, we've exported investment and jobs through uh, the, the, uh, the deindustrialization of Europe. And I think that is becoming better understood. And the conversation actually in Brussels has become more balanced. Can I just say actually that I'm happy to take points or questions as we go through and have a conversation rather than have a kind of me present and then you ask questions later. If you ask a question that needs a long answer, I'll say, why don't we come back to it later? But by all means, just, you know, let's have a go. Yeah? Um, right, let's get, make some points about competitiveness. Uh, this is uh, maybe the longer section, um, but the most important part here actually is the discussion we have at the end. So, um, We'll cover the fitness check in the European refining competitiveness in a global context, uh, climate change in ETS, and then look at energy and policy costs in, in Europe at the refining side. Significance of a competitive domestic refining sector in Europe. Uh, some numbers, I don't know you've seen, too many numbers, but um, <clears throat> added value to the economy from refining, 23 billion a year huge amount of taxes generated from the products, 270 billion a year. This number here, 35%, refers to the fact that, on average, Europe's refineries are lower CO2 compared with the rest of the world. And so where we see volume being supplied from outside of Europe, or basically the market share goes more to imports, that's a net increase in CO2. Security of supply, we provide fuel for millions, hundreds of millions of cars, millions of trucks and thousands of planes and ships. And um, just one of the things we'll occasionally say is there's a big vision of electrification out there. It's pretty hard to store 90 days worth of electricity that we do it for governments routinely. You know, it's just taken for granted. Challenges faced by the European refineries, uh, we're all familiar with these high energy prices relative to other regions of the world, uh, against competition from the non-EU, uh, uh, reduction in oil products demand, and that's the success of energy efficiency standards for vehicles. Gasoline diesel imbalance uh, has been uh, excruciating for many players, and I know in Spain, uh, the very, very heavy diesel portion of the fleet has really been very difficult. Um, we also see the cumulative impact of regulation. Good to have this recognised by the Commission. This is a number produced by the European Commission through their fitness check 25% of the loss of competitiveness. Politically, this is real progress to have an official number for protocol. Uh, this is a depressing bit, the track record of closures, the capacity closures um, in the last uh, eight years there, uh, with a particularly bad period, 2011-2013. Clearly, refining margins have been better in the last year, and there are predictions that maybe it won't be too bad this year, I don't know. Uh, it probably depends on the uh, build-out of capacity elsewhere. Um, but uh, I think without going into specific, uh, um, specific uh, predictions or anything, it's, we're certainly not at the point where we say we have a healthy refining industry in Europe. We have very many of these challenges in the year. The European refinery is closed in 2008, 2014. The so fitness ship, sorry. Not the question, but the comment, if you want to probably that will promote other knowledge or questions. I think that when you look into these uh, imports of diesel, 
you immediately see the difference and how uh, the how the crisis has affected or impacted the different member states or countries. Because in 2008, my recollection is correct, uh, of this 35 percent, more than 50 percent was coming to Spain. So right now, how much of the 41 comes to Spain? Probably hmm? 10. So huge difference. So the crisis has affected in a completely different way the different member states. And the other, the other encouraging sign that we're seeing though is that some countries are starting to rebalance the taxation of the products uh, towards, towards uh, you know, basically equal taxation of natural and diesel. And also how much different member states are refining companies in different member states have invested during the recent year. So the fitness check um, prepared by the European Commission recognises and quantifies cost of legislation <coughs> up to 2012, and uh, this uh, this uh, quantified it as 47 cents. So this is kind of a you know it's a snapshot. We need to see this um, refreshed, and the proposals to go forward actually will mean this figure grows significantly. We will go into detail in this one, um, but you know. This compares with a, a range of uh, uh, gross margins estimated by the McKenzie for so Northwest Europe uh, refinery between 0 and 4 euros. So a very significant number. I've made a point about the, uh, the recognition from the European Commission may now comes um, you know, the importance of the, Euro the European refining sector, 0.9% of the EU GDP about 1.3 million jobs overall, depending on that, about 140,000 direct high quality jobs, and many others as well. Very useful. Uh, a recognition that a significant additional regulatory uh, cost or costs are coming post-2012. We've got no quantification of that by the Commission. Uh, we see this is, this is the, the, uh, the modelling of ETS costs that we've done ourselves. Recognizing that phase two, we basically had 100% free allowances, and arguably there was you know, slight over allocation. Phase three, we've got a significant cost 23% of purchased allowances, and based on a price during a period of 10 euros, about six cents a barrel. I don't know, it's not huge. But we're going to grow that for two reasons. One is the carbon price will be likely driven up through this market stability reserve, and then also. Even though we're still essentially in negotiation, we do expect to have to have the industry purchase a larger number of allowances. So our modelling is, is you know, it's a multiplication of the two different policy measures: market stability reserve and fewer free allowances. And so we expect that to be growing to more like a quarter of a euro on a barrel. Um, one of the questions we need to start thinking about, even though we're still negotiating here, what does phase, phase five and six look like? You know, higher price still, fewer free allowances. And of course, the key point about ETS is it only applies to domestic production. It's the fundamental flaw of the flagship policy. This is the flagship policy for Europe. It's got a fundamental flaw. We'll come back to that. Uh, import trend. I um, think uh, this is uh, no news. The competition, we find it is like this below. Um, Jan Magar in India. Reliance, it's a monster. Uh, it's modern, it's very complex. Uh, actually, a, a friend of mine from a former period of uh, my career uh, is the trading manager for Reliance, and uh, I understand that they've had an amazing couple of years. They are very, very profitable. Some of that comes to Europe. Uh, they, uh, they built the refinery to produce ultra low sulfur diesel in huge quantities. They have pipelines like this that run down to the uh, jetties and they fill very large ships. That's the competition. Uh, that and similar things being built in the Middle East. So, what is being built around the world? I think some of you may have seen this chart. <coughs> Announced capacity additions and investment costs for different regions of the world, with Europe at the bottom end there. In fact, these projects are the, are the Exxon Mobil projects. More being spent, not a huge amount in capacity growth. This is more about complexity and integration with PECX and what's going on there. But the proposals to build significant capacity in the Middle East clearly built around the 
fact that they've got the resources there in terms of the crude, but also the gas and the marginal cost of gas. He estimates is probably near zero, and uh, it's a very sensible strategy <coughs> to export not just the crude, but it's it's a way of importing exporting the gas as well because you use it for the refining, and then you get the refining margin. So it's a very sensible strategy from the Middle East, and that's clearly where they're intending to go. Um, in terms of cost builder. I've been, I've spoken here in Madrid a couple of times before, used an earlier version of this chart. This is a new version which reflects lower energy costs and some new analysis, and uh, we've tested this with Solomon. We've had numerous phone calls and working through with Solomon to get this right. And one of the things, the key adjustment we've made since the previous version is the energy costs have come down. But we've also included, we really also recognize that not only is there a crude a product freight for products coming in from the Middle East or elsewhere, but there is a crude freight that a Middle East refinery wouldn't have to bear. So we still see a competitive disadvantage of a couple of barrels there. And energy cost and regulatory cost are the key differences. Actually, in the real world, this is not quite right. We use Solomon data for a generic, an average EU refinery, and an average Middle East refinery. The real competition is not the average Middle East refinery, it's a modern complex machine that has got a really good yield of products, of high value products. It will have likely lower labor costs, lower maintenance, and lower energy again. And so they have a, a strong advantage. This chart has been very useful just to help people to understand how the regulation and energy costs actually appear in the cost builder. And it's been a powerful slide for the European Commission and very appreciative of this. And uh, even though it's got some challenges as to how representative it is, it tells the right story. Sure. Why, why, and I hope there will be more questions from other people. Why do we still have uh, an important difference between our numbers and the Commission numbers? So this is a, a, this is a current and forward looking number. The regulatory cost is a modeled 2020 number. Whereas the commission's number for the fitness check is a 2012 number. But, but when they refer to industrial emissions, they are not referring to the same directive. The, what? Uh, so uh, there is maybe a mix. Um, we have got a big, a big portion here for the IED, which is not in those other numbers before. The IED is a significant cost, you see that, uh, potentially over a, over a, over a dollar a barrel. So they will not cover this. No, not in that one because that's only 2012. Is right? it REV that it's going to be implemented by 2018? I think is it REV the one that is doing the difference? Uh, okay. In this case. Yeah. You know, as I'm looking at these charts that we've got, I'm thinking the, we can do more to show the evolution of, 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 of costs from fitness check onwards because it's very clear. And there's a lot of work we've now got to bring together to talk about how regulatory and policy costs are, are, are increasing to the sector. And the reps that they are considering is what the European average rep or what is being considered? Probably a question for you. Yeah, because <laughs> my understanding is that in Spain, even if you think an autonomous solution, reps are not homogeneous. My understanding is that even in Spain, different committees different autonomous regions have different opinions regarding breadth. Yeah. Different opinions means different costs. So what's the breadth there? Yeah. Is it an average for Europe or what's that? No, the, <laughs> no, the breadth establishes two, two references. Uh, the limit is based on, a, on, a, on, on an I am. On, I, I mean, the, the, the breadth establishes different limits for the reasons to the atmosphere and, and for the wastewater. And uh, it is supposed that all the member states uh, have to implement the, at least the, the upper range of the limit. So this is based on the upper, on the upper range. Uh, it's, it's true that you can apply for some exceptions on the application of the limits, but this is not considered here. And this is what is making the difference in Spain, I think. So it's based on the upper range and uh, equal for everybody. For example, if the breath establishes a certain number for the uh, particle emission from the FCC, this is supposed to be supposed that everybody is working in, in, in this condition. Yeah. 
this one is for the verb breath or for the verbs? No, this is one is for the finding. So if they, yeah, it's not the really the yeah, but you don't yeah. consider that you have crackers and all the facilities okay. inside the refineries. It's, it's, it has been made for the refining business, <coughs> it's just refining. Okay, next. No, I, you know, if you want my, 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 my concern always is that, of course, we have to, we have to complain and to, to, yeah. to make clear where we are not properly treated, but at the same time, we have not to exaggerate. And when we talk about $1.4 per hour, it's a lot. Yes. Yeah, it can be challenged, yeah. yeah. But the problem here is that we are not impressing too much the officials with the commission. <coughs> We were in the final forum and the message from the commissioner uh, from Maria Scandite. We were not very much uh, impressed by our lack of competitiveness. He was always in, uh, stressing the message of decarbonizing, decarbonizing, and decarbonizing. Uh, it's a bit discouraging. Uh, we are working and we are putting figures and, uh, at the uh, the top policy officials, they are not listening too much to our messages. No, what are the things we've been pushing for? We've been pushing for a repeat of the fitness check. 2012 is a start <coughs> for the numbers. The next fitness check needs to look at precisely these issues. And it's one thing for the industry to provide an estimate. It would be far better if the Commission sets up the study and then we get officially recognized numbers. And that would be a way of getting out of getting it to, I think, to take it seriously. Uh, Spain is one of the member states that has called for and repeat of the fitness check. That's very helpful way to start. That's one of the things we need to just find out. That's good. The, the difference in the energy between the two cases are very big also. Which are the main reasons? The prices of gas or the efficiency of fuel so, uh, refineries in Middle East? Or we well, we, we don't know for certain because this is data that is produced for us by Solomon and they have not broken it down or given reasons behind the different numbers. But we believe that in the Middle East, this refinery will be not an efficient refinery in terms of energy usage. There is no incentive for them to have good uh, energy efficiency because they will have such a low cost of energy. So we, we expect this, uh, the energy cost difference here on a unit basis to be many times the factor of three that we've got there. It could well be that the, you know, the Saudi Aramco refinery uh, basically gets its gas for nothing. Which is the, the transfer price in this country. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's from one shape to another. Yeah. Uh, many of these regions have got essentially stranded, you know, gas assets. They don't have enough assets to get the gas out. So domestic consumption, the marginal cost is probably basically zero. Um, so yeah, we get a number of you know, three times their cost of energy, even after we've done any energy efficiency. Um, one question. What level of price is consumer What level of price I think this was, we, so this is 2014 data. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know the exact number, so what is it? Right, uh, something about the future role of petroleum in transport. Now, this could be a very long section. I've, I've chosen to just use a couple of data points in the cheap graph here. And the basic point that we make here is that the options for decarbonizing transport tend to come in at a very high cost once you've done efficiency. I, uh, don't have a graph that works through the numbers on efficiency, but I think we all understand that if we, if we have to pay a little more for a car, but it has a much better fuel consumption, the total cost of ownership could well be similar to the baseline or even lower. We still believe that there's some further to go in that direction. Our big concern comes not so much from the efficiency, it's the attempts to do an outright replacement of petroleum, which tends to come in at a much higher cost. I'll start with an example that we'll work through uh, that, um, that talks about what are the real costs of doing electrification. Some of you will have seen this before. I apologize if you've seen it before. Uh, for those of you that you haven't, I think it's an important point to, uh, to work through. This is an example of how we work through the policy costs of electrification. 
Now, let me just say before I go through the numbers, that there's lots of press coverage of all the exciting developments in batteries and how the uh, cost is coming down. Uh, Tesla are announcing plans to sell lots of cars at uh, 35,000 uh, dollars. Uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance uh, proposing the cost of batteries will come back come down by two thirds. Some of that may be true. This particular piece of analysis has not taken battery costs as a key as the key piece of evidence. It's taken the call for incentives and cross subsidies and the trend that we see there. So we describe it as policy costs. Um, and uh, before I go to the analysis, let's just say we are also skeptical about the technology progress. We recognise from analysis of the Financial Times and others, Tesla have yet to make a profit. They are burning share, uh, you know, share capital. Uh, they keep selling more shares. And uh, they are making a loss at the moment, according to Financial Times analysis, of between $4,000 and $14,000 per car. And that has been at an average selling price of about 120,000 euros per car. So they now make a proposition to sell many more cars, smaller cars, but at $35,000. Um, they also propose to build a factory to do the batteries to do this. There are good reasons to have some concern, some doubt, but there's real risk about whether their business model could work. And one of our concerns is that there is now this vision in Europe developing that this is where our car industry has to be forced to go. And yet the car industry is very clear, nobody's made a profit yet making electric cars. Far from it. This analysis looks at the policy costs, the public money that's going into electrification right now. And we'll just talk through the physical outcome and the financial outcome. On the left-hand side, we take some analysis that was done uh, by one of the technical joint ventures in Brussels. JRC is, so this is three parties here, J, E, and C. J stands for JRC, the European Commission Technical Body. E stands for UCAR, the Car Makers Scientific Association. C stands for CONCARI, which is the science organization part of uh, Fuels Europe and CONCARI. Working together back in 2014, they developed numbers for well to wheel CO2 emissions for a wide range of different uh, fuels uh, based on the mid size, think of a Volkswagen Golf or Nissan Leaf type vehicle. And we've picked just two data points here battery electric vehicle using a 2014 mixture of electricity sources, the unit, and B7, 7% fame in biodiesel. Uh, biodiesel in, in petroleum diesel. So think of this as being <coughs> an efficient model golf, and this as being this, I believe. 101 grams here, 57 grams here in this jar. And so by switching from here to the electric car, you save 44 grams per kilometre. If you assume that the vehicle gets driven for 200,000 kilometres for its life, the maths here 200,000 kilometres times 44 grams. 8,800 kilograms, 8.8 .8 tons of saving for the vehicle. Right? Then let's look at the cost inputs here. Well, we are told repeatedly, and the, the, the head of data has said publicly many times, we make a loss on every vehicle we sell. We calculate that loss to be roughly 4,000 euros. It's more of an estimate, but based on the number of data points, a few thousand euros per car. The car regulation actually encourages car makers to cross subsidize. That's, it can go up to $9,000 per car. So we think a mid range of the 4000 And then in most countries, I don't know the situation in Spain, but in most countries you get a purchase grant if you buy an electric vehicle. In the UK it's about £4,000, uh, in Germany it's €4,000, in some countries it's €7,500. And, and we've taken a mid range of €5,000. Some things that's not often pointed out, there is a loss of fuel rent an exemption from any fuel tax if you run an electric vehicle. And that's a few thousand uh, euros per, per lifetime of car. We factor in at a societal cost. At the moment, electricity does cost less than the petroleum, so there's a cost savings, so we acknowledge that. You add it up, the societal cost is about 10,000 euros. If you do it just for the consumer, it's about 15,000 euros. They get the cross subsidy, the government purchase grant, and the loss of fuel excise duty. So their own benefit or their own uh, sweetening of the deal, if you like, is around 14,000, 15,000 euros. 
Take it as 10,000 euros, 8.8 tonnes to an input of 10,000 euros implies a carbon cost of 1,100 euros a tonne, compared to the current ETS cost of 5 euros a tonne. It's an enormous difference. When we show this chart, one of the questions we'll get is, aha, but of course the whole idea of electrification is based on, we'll move to green electricity. Yes, we would agree, but let's still do the maths. So you'd go from 101 grams to a zero electric option here, so that would be a naught. So we put the numbers in the chart again, this would be 100 or 101 times 200,000 kilometers, 20 tons. So 20 tons for 10,000 euros, you're down to 500 euros a ton. You're still 100 times the ETS price. You can do the maths multiple ways, but you always end up with a really high marginal abatement cost for CO2 using electrification. And what's interesting is that the calls for incentives and policy support for electrification are going up, not down. The latest we hear is that the car makers are saying, yes, we have to recognize we're going to electrification in the long term, but we'll need incentives to get us there, and we'll need heavy investment in the grid and in the infrastructure for charging. And they're saying they need you know, a ratio of, you know, for every million electric cars, they need, I think they're saying, one charging position for every five cars. And that translates to a few thousand charging points to be installed every day for the next 30 years. It's enormous. That will require grid development. And if the, if the charging is not, I quote the power industry, if the charging is not managed by smart meters, you need additional generation capacity too. So the proposition is a very, very far-reaching one with costs that go beyond these costs on this chart. Um, this chart, so again, I think I used it uh, at a, a seminar that we did uh, here in Madrid uh, earlier this year, late, late last year. A chart that we've put together to try and help people think in a global way about the decolonization challenge. And this chart is a sketch based on the IEA cost curve for decarbonisation, I think it was 2009. It is basically setting out with some numbers what are the big options available to us globally for doing things in transport and power and also in carbon sequestration. And uh, efficiency, I've described, can sometimes be negative, sometimes, and as you go further, this bar will actually be above the line. But still quite a lot can be done within a reasonable carbon price. Fuel switching in power is mostly about going from coal to gas. Renewables in power is essentially wind and solar adoption. Reforestation is not necessarily in Europe. Um, there are large opportunities across Africa and in, Far East, in Southeast Asia, uh, peatland reclamation, for example. Carbon uh, capture and storage is, I think, many people in the energy industry know something about it regarded as expensive. We hear it over and over again, it's too expensive. But then you come to first generation and then advanced biofuels. I haven't done the maths on this particular occasion, but quite reliably coming out at around 200 euros a tonne, sometimes 300 euros a tonne, for whichever we you look at. Uh, EcoFist did a recent study for the European Commission looking at cellulose biofuels, and they came out with a mature cost of maybe 200 euros a tonne. Transport electrification, you see, and it could easily go well off the graph here for this particular number. What's interesting here is that if you look at where policy is working in Europe, it's working for transport at opposite ends of the chart. It's really strange the way it just goes to opposite ends. You've got efficiency of the vehicles that is working at this end, and then policies to basically seek the replacement of petroleum at the far end. Um, whereas policies in power, this is ETS and also mandates that operate in the power sector, renewable energy directive, as it applies to the power sector. There have been many, many calls for an economy-wide carbon price, always stronger carbon price. Around the Paris summit, lots of voices came forward. Ségolène Royal in France, the ecology minister, who will actually chair the Marrakesh summit, has been proposing 80 to 100 euros for some time and is now proposing a carbon price corridor, a floor and a ceiling. We took all those different calls and we put a grey bar across the graph that we can 
20 to 80 while you were good, good enough to allow them. And we showed what do you cover in terms of options? What options become alive if you actually implement that? And what's clear is total carbon price would make probably all use of coal will disappear across Europe. And that would in itself would make a significant coal and lignite significant change. It would make moving into renewables without further subsidies themselves on its own. Reforestation, lots of reforestation is available at 50 euros. Quite a lot is available, I'm told, at 10 euros if we've got the global politics right. And CCS starts to look attractive, interesting. Whereas, if a global carbon price is your primary instrument or an economy wide carbon price, complete replacement of petroleum is not yet competitive. Um, we point out this circle as well. This is where European policy is not working. Nothing makes anything happen there. We have this huge gap in the middle. We are deeply confused about carbon policy in Europe. Um, so I'm going to just throw, throw a few numbers into the room to provoke a bit of conversation here. Policy costs in energy in the EU are passed on to consumers. The power sector, so I'll, I'll just explain that some of these costs, we, we need to verify the sources of a couple of the numbers here on this chart. But we believe that in renewables in power, that the incentives cost the industry the order of 60 billion a year. Whereas the, their ETS costs are three, 3 billion, they spend 60 billion meeting, uh, the, um, uh, meeting the mandates for renewables. For the fuels industry, what do we spend on biofuels? Uh, the, basically, the, the premium that we pay for foam or HVO over fossil fuel, and then have to pass on to the customer about 7 billion. And currently, an annual electrification incentive is running at about 1.5. It's actually a tiny number of vehicles, but it's you know, 10,000 euros per vehicle. And we've done a rough calculation of the carbon costs associated with that. 100 euros in power, about 200 in uh, biofuels, and about 1,000 in electrification. But yet we've got an ETS of 5 euros. It's a little odd, really. Um, the system we have, actually, is kind of lying to the citizen and the business. The real carbon cost in Europe is 100 euros or something or more. Uh, that is the cost of European policy. We are not saying that's wrong, but it's not transparent. It's not technology neutral. It supports some very expensive solutions. It's very unlikely to be economically efficient because we've got that great big gap in the middle. We really ought to be finding the mid-cost solutions with a big scale and can do a big chunk of work decarbonizing the economy. And CCS is an example. I don't necessarily want that up as the solution, but it's a kind of a test case in policy. You know, does it make it work? And the best the best challenge to, to me coming from the downstream industry is to say, just look at how one of our members uh, is in this situation with carbon markets. Um, a refiner sits between two carbon markets, the ETS world, the five euros, and the blending of biofuels, 200 euros or more. And yet we have CCS that sits in the middle of that range. It doesn't work with either. Um, it's far too expensive to consider CCS as a means of complying with the ETS because ETS costs you five euros a ton and uh, CCS costs you a hundred. But meeting a GHG reduction with CCS is half the cost of blending biofuels. Half the cost. We, 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 so we sit in this ridiculous situation where a solution that is physically available and has been tested doesn't, is not supported by any regulation. There's a huge range of different things we can do between 50 and 100 euros, or 50 and 150 euros, that would do a lot of the work of decarbonisation, but we can't make it work in Europe. So, we are developing our policy statements around this, but we are going to be calling for transparency in terms of the world. Yeah. Yeah. But you really think that after the, all the debate that we had in Europe, CCS is something that could be quite 
you make a good point about public acceptance of CCS. It certainly applies onshore. Um, we can see the uh, we can see the, the, the public reaction about fracking to be similar with CCS. But we also have a lot of offshore gas fields that are depleted. And I can't see that CCS will be a universal solution, but we should find ways of making it work where it can work. You know, the, 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 the North Sea, either off the UK or off the uh, Netherlands, has got you know, depleted gas reserves. There's a lot of infrastructure in place. You know, gas in the, in the ground under pressure, whether it's methane or whether it's CO2, if it's under the ocean, there's a perfect case of it. There are also some technologies coming forward that, that, that show that the CO2 will actually chemically react and become inert. And there was some recent work by one of the UK universities that showed that under certain geologies, the CO2 is no longer gaseous after two years. I, I don't know what the experience of other Spanish companies may have, but we try to develop a project. Uh, of course, people could say to me, or steps that people could say to me that was in Doñana, or close to Doñana. Doñana is not too old. Reserve for Spain. But, uh, it was objected by everybody, yeah? even by the vision. So, so I think that, uh, do you, are you doing something on uh, all the different companies in Spain and, and with what? Yes. For us, it's impossible. The future of CCS uh, regarding a uh, means for future based on renewables is very complex to justify the very cost that. Uh, uh, a cool plant, power plant, uh, increase the fixed cost uh, based on CCS. It's, uh, um, it's very complex to, to be profitable. But it, it has always been challenged as being unprofitable where that is a market regulated under ETS. You know, we started with ETS prices more like 20 euros, so people hoped they would go up. They went down. And with it, the fortunes of CCS. The proposal here is actually that we find a way of getting a proper economy-wide carbon pricing regulation. And at 100 euros a ton, CCS would be attractive. And people would look again at how do we make the technology work? Um, what locations could it work? People have already done some of that work. You know, the Rotterdam refining cluster close to the, North, the Netherlands uh, gas fields could be an obvious uh, uh, route. And another point you would say is, Perhaps if you allow this as a solution, you allow locations outside of Europe to do it as part of the European contribution. You know, maybe there's a way of doing this in the Middle East. I don't know. You know, let's at least have the conversation about how, as I say, it's a test case. It's not necessarily this is the specific solution. The whole point is, if you have a higher carbon price, there's a lot in the middle in that, that, that middle range of cost that opens up. When your mix is decarbonized at your team, you don't need to capture any CO2. So say that again. If, when your mix in the future is more or less 800% uh, of the total uh, power in, installed, yeah. uh, that, was, uh, that means that it was uh, in origin decar decarbonized. You don't need to capture any, any CO2 when you are based on hydro, wind power plants, nuclear, and that is the mix uh, that uh, make uh, all the effort in don't have any CO2 emissions, you don't right. need to capture it. Right. And the future thermal power plants, uh, based in the projection of energy efficiency demand for future, uh, we have a, a small part of contribution only to balance the when, when the renewables uh, didn't appear in, in our mix, that's the only moment that our capacity installed uh, uh, made possible the 100% of the electricity per year. Right. So you're right, we are heading towards a substantially decarbonized grid. So the opportunity to do this at, um, at power stations will be reduced. But we do have our own industrial sites, we have other energy intensive industries. And we also know that there will be a lot of fossil fuel use around the world. Um, I, go back to, I go back to this graph here. If we were to consider this as a global challenge rather than a European one, all the projections for what energy use will be meeting 450, 450 ppm scenarios show significant use of fossil fuel outside of the OECD countries. Yes, um, but uh, in the energy scenario of the European Commission, 
2015, in 2015 uh, we have a mix based on non-emission uh, technologies, at least 85% of the right. total electricity sector. Yeah. And on that slide, you consider that uh, the subventions for electric vehicles or uh, in pure efficiency vehicles at uh, forever and ever. And that's only a short measure that uh, the politician use in, in short terms, one, two, three years, yeah. to remove the first barrier to introduce hydrogen, uh, LNG, and electric vehicles. Uh, you, you can't uh, assure that uh, the cost, cost of abatement for future is forever and ever based on subventions over the cost. I, I, we completely agree. I mean, at the, whole, the whole point, I think, is not to say we don't do electrification. The whole point is you have something more like a carbon market that chooses the next big solution. And when electrification comes in at 200 or 100 euros, you say, right, we do that. But the whole point is you have something more like a market that delivers you economic efficiency. Yeah, that's Rather than have politicians pick particular solutions. Because just to be provocative, where we're heading, where we're heading in Europe, right, is that we'll do these, in particular electrification. Whereas India and China will do a lot less and they'll actually carry on using coal for most of their power. Whereas Okay, I take your point at the moment, it's a thousand euros a ton to do this here. Well, you know, it will but have uh, let, let me explain my, my own case. Yeah. Uh, I have two cars. A diesel car yeah. uh, with the uh, energy efficiency uh, level A yeah. and another electric vehicle. It's right. for sure because I, I belong to, to invest in yeah. so If not, they kill me. <laughs> but in, in my first car, I received from the government 2,000 euros based on the high energy efficiency that that car uh, mm -hmm. introduced on mm -hmm. the average mix. Mm -hmm. And with the second, I received 4,000. We don't expect uh, to receive more money for future cars. For example, my next car, uh, reserved is a Tesla, uh, the cost <laughs> is 35,000 uh, euros, mm -hmm. and we reduce the total cost of fuel of energy of for this in that car in mm -hmm. 10 years of the total cycle life, mm -hmm. when we analyze the total cost ownership, uh, I will use five times my deal in energy. Can I ask you, your electric car, how many kilometers have you done with this car? So Tesla, 400. In your Tesla? Yes. You have a Tesla? Yes. And you've done 400 kilometers? 400. How, how, how long have you had the vehicle? How long? Yeah. Uh, whatever I want. Mm -hmm. How many from the one year? One year, you've done 400 kilometers. So how many tons of CO2 have you saved by, by having that vehicle instead of a... My other uh, total uh, kilometers per year is 50,000. Right, okay. So you, my, my point would be the, 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 the public, you had some... Two, two tons, two tons yeah? per year, two tons per year. But, but if, you, if you've done 400 kilometers in the Tesla, that's one tank of fuel, right? Mm -hmm. So you may have saved kilograms rather than tons of CO2. I recharge it during the night. And here in Spain, we are not poor. Right. We are not based on coal pl right. power plants. Yeah. We have a mix uh, when you uh, move time to wheel in that uh, type of car. Uh, uh, we employ 20 uh, kilowatt hour per 100 kilometers, right. and our average uh, mix during the night is more or less 10 right. grams. So it's zero. So you, but you could say, okay, it's green electricity in the night. It's my choice. But, but the point is that, I mean, another point about the electric cars, they tend to be lower mileage. You look at the second-hand car market today. I have been generous with this analysis. The one that slide I had before. This one here, we are generous by saying the electric car does 200,000 kilometers. Have you ever seen an electric car with 200,000 kilometers in the flock? I've never seen one on the market. Yes, but the, the, the CO2 saving is 100%. Uh, yes, if I compare with my previous car, it's 126 yes. grams per kilometer. Right. So nice. uh, remove the car. Uh, and you don't need to consider the subsidy for future because the subsidy start probably next year. Stop. Stop.
the, the, the government cut all the subsidies in, on that unnecessary um, uh, measure. If you look at the Tesla accounts, they make thousands of euros per car on selling the credits, the policy credits to other car makers. That's the first line there, the manufacturing cost subsidy. The third line is the loss of fuel excise duty. You know, the, the petroleum is taxed at 300%. Mm -hmm. which is actually that's about 300 euros a tonne as a carbon cost. Mm -hmm. And the user of a Tesla or a Nissan Leaf pays no tax. So you say the incentives are going, <coughs> the second line they go. Is that the air profit? Yeah, the second line, but the other ones are still there. I yeah. don't know the manufacturing right. of subsidy is uh, an issue. Yeah. So but let's say let's say the, the purchase ground goes, and this goes from 10,000 to 5,000 euros. But you're indicating a lower mileage, and this is the truth for most electric cars. Yes. This number is, is, you know, it may not be 20, 200,000 kilometers. For many cars, it could be 40,000 kilometers, right? And so you may have then uh, 100 grams of saving times 40 kilometers. There's four times. If this column here still adds up to 5,000, you still back to 1,000 a ton. Yes, but for the future, the subsidies, uh, they are not sustainable for any, I agree. <laughs> any business. Okay, yeah. Look, I think the Tesla is a fantastic product. As a mechanical engineer, the electric motor is the dream machine for propelling, uh, propelling cars. It's easily packaged, it's clean, it's very easily controllable, it has great torque. But the battery is expensive and a very poor form of uh, energy storage. We haven't yet seen the full life cycle, the manufacturing, the recycling, the life of the battery. It should have a chance to compete. It's a good technology, it should compete. And our simple point is, let's get to a, a, a sensible, economy-wide carbon price, and then the market can decide, and people can decide based on, is that the characteristic of the car that I want? Am I prepared to pay a premium price for a Tesla, etc., with a fair carbon cost? And, it, you know, with, with green electricity, it qualifies for some sort of support, absolutely. The simple point is, let's get to a rational system where you pick solutions that come forward at a sensible carbon price, rather than have policy makers say, I like this one, I'll, I'll make it say, cost no object to make that one work. That's, that's all I'm saying. Really. You know, your point is very clear, John, that with the current ETS, Um, so can I let, just get back to some of the points that we were making. Uh, we call for transparency in costs of carbon imposed by policy. And we're not saying 100 is wrong or 200 is wrong. Let's have a proper public debate about what's the right cost and how we get the right solutions to come forward. The transparency is the starting point. Yeah? And that's the way to get good value. We also, I think we have to be brutally honest with politicians and with consumers that we are not going to meet Europe's ambitions, and Europe's ambitions are well politically founded. We're not going to reach our ambitions of climate leadership with the five euro a ton of carbon cost. And that then comes back to the industrial aspect and the competition and carbon leakage argument. That at the moment we're pretending we can just about do carbon leakage based around the price of, of five euros. Realistically, we need a carbon price of 100. As, you know, let's pick a number. It's, a, it's more like 100 than five. But if we apply that to energy intensive industries, manufacturing in Europe, but not the companies that import from outside, whether you're talking steel, or silicon, <coughs> fertilizer, or refined products, it's not going to work because you'll simply, you know, there is a loophole in ETS, it is called making products outside of Europe. Yeah? And as long as you've got that, that's what the market will do. So it pushes you in a difficult conversation, but we've got to find a way to make a level playing field at the market level rather than the, rather than the, you know, to have it as a, as a pure producer tax, if you like. Uh, so, some observations and conclusions. The conclusions are policy points we can make now. The observations are points that we are making and we want to provoke a discussion here. And these are possibly the, con the conclusions that we reach in a few months when we've thought about a bit more of an industry or a set of industries. Europe's climate and energy policies are deeply confused about carbon prices. Uh, my own politics and an element of pretense, may I say, with Europe's average carbon cost far higher than the current DTS cost. 
there will be many, many benefits from greater transparency and consistency of carbon costs and price signals and policy. We think we can do this transparency thing starting now. We should have a much better idea for what each of these policy measures costs. Uh, we see that many large-scale carbon abatement opportunities are available, often at lower cost, in diverse sectors of the economy. <laughs> Sorry, I'm uh, many large-scale uh, sectors, often in uh, other regions of the world as well. The current flagship policy in ETS has its major flaw. Let's talk about that. Carbon leakage protection will be less and less effective in the future. We've got um, a higher price expected anyway in ETS and fewer free allowances. We think we've got to put this issue of the trade, the international level playing field on the, on, on, on the table right now. And we believe Europe at the moment has got this political ambition to do more than anyone else on its own, with no linkages. The Paris Agreement provides four linkages where you can potentially link carbon markets. We think that would be very healthy, and we would like to see a vision of an economy-wide carbon price encouraging other countries to do something similar, and then to allow a degree of cross-trading that would be politically powerful, but would also bring economic efficiency. And that's where we think we're heading as, as an industry to pr promote that as a, as a solution. But that's in the future. There's points that we can say now, today. Um, the European Commission have a very helpful dialogue with the refining sector through the refining forum, also the refining fitness check. So it's funny how we have all of these points. Um, as requested by several member states, the refining fitness check should be regularly updated. We still have strong competitiveness challenges for the sector. And by the way, I should also say, even though there actually is a clear recognition that for many parts of the barrel, aviation, marine, heavy duty, petrochemicals, will need petroleum products for decades to come. There is no alternative technology that's viable at scale for any of those. At best, electrification will uh, replace around 30% of the barrel of petroleum that would be all of gasoline around a third of diesel use. Um, and so that's the scale of the vision. There is a problem from a refining competitiveness standpoint there, of course, and that is no gasoline demand in Europe means that the refining model will be very challenged. It will be a little bit like, like uh, um, starting a beef cattle farm when the market only requires uh, fill and steak. You've got to make use of the whole natural resource that you've got. And if our domestic market turns its back on part of it, which are. Energy costs are expected to continue to, the biggest, to be the biggest element of international competitive disadvantage. ETS costs will rise as a result of phase four, necess necessitating full carbon leakage protection. European energy strategy should recognize the, the longer term role of refineries, petroleum fuels, and petroleum products. We should keep Europe's fuels and other strategic oil products refined in the EU. Climate and energy strategies, including those of transport, should take consideration of cost of carbon and energy to keep going. Happy to take questions or discussion. That's the end of my slides. Apart from the backup, but if you've got any tough questions, I might go to the backup. John, thanks. Very, very true your presentation. We have tough uh, time ahead of us, uh, but uh, I think a part of all the point that you have uh, shown to us, we are unfortunately facing a lot of challenges, especially regarding inequality, affecting the transport in big towns. Perhaps uh, uh, here, because we are in Madrid and Barcelona and other big towns, <coughs> we have already discussed with uh, uh, people regarding mobility in towns and they are really worried about uh, any of the two emissions and uh, particular uh, emissions in big towns. We saw recently the Paris uh, uh, strategy about uh, taking and uh, attacking the form of uh, contamination pollution in Paris and probably all the big towns will follow that strategy. So, I think it's a point that we have to be clear uh, as an industry that uh, 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 we have to, to, to face uh, the problem that uh, how can we uh, 
manage uh, better that going that way. Now, in two or three years, it will, it will, be, it will grow as much as the uh, greenhouse uh, emissions. I think a, a few words about that quality are important. I think we have to recognize, and I'm talking to the petroleum industry uh, guys here, the petroleum industry has to recognize that there is a strong vision around electrification and transport for multiple reasons. And um, we can argue with the economics, but there's many things about the vision that are attractive to, to society. One of them is air quality, and the sterility of an electric car is no doubt attractive for urban use. Um, and there are for sure applications where that seems to make a lot of sense. Whether that's for personal cars is debatable. Um, I think the use of electricity and taxes may, should come far before you, you, you spend the money on personal cars for city use, because one of our objectives in cities is congestion as well. Um, but the other point about the powertrain you use and air quality is just a concern that sometimes the baseline there may be a bit at fault. And we believe that where people holding up the electric car is a big solution to air quality in cities, they're considering the baseline to be, they imagine, a 20-year-old diesel vehicle that is not, maybe not very well maintained and produces visible smoke and very, very noticeable smell. You replace that with an electric car. Of course, you get a very significant improvement. We believe the proper fair comparison is the best available technology that can be put on the market in 2020 and can be regulated through Euro 6 and the other regulations that go hand in hand with that, a new drive cycle, the WLTP drive cycle, the real driving emissions requirement, RDE. You put all that together, you get very, very low emissions. And uh, some of us talked earlier. Um, that already we see gasoline with quite an incredible best available technology, where a gasoline hybrid um, has got, for real intents and purposes, the air quality emissions in a city are near zero, and possibly even at zero or below. Um, the, the testing of vehicles can sometimes show the, the CO2, sorry, the CO uh, hydrocarbons and NOx out of the tailpipe can be lower than ambient because of the very high effectiveness of the three mechanics. So we haven't done quantification work on this yet, and we think it's worthwhile doing. My own personal experience, I started, by the way, in the motor industry doing emissions development on advanced powertrains for what is now Jaguar Land Rover. Uh, and I still have kept in touch with, with many colleagues in that field. I would, if, if you could construct a trial for the public where you fill the street with electric vehicles and got people to cross the road in that urban street, and then you did the same exercise, but you had um, vehicles of the technology level of the latest Toyota Prius. I would challenge people to actually notice the difference, either in, either in sound or smell, or in measure their quality. Um, the, uh, the modern gasoline hybrids are incredibly good at exhaust after treatment. They will run on electric mode quite a bit of the time in cities. They're incredibly quiet, whether they're on gasoline or electricity. And so if you then take that as the baseline, given that that needs no subsidies at all, it's, it's a business model that works for the car maker and the energy provider today, um, and it's available at scale today, uh, you take that as your baseline, the incremental improvement of a Leaf or Tesla over that is small, right? And so you should judge the extra incentive you give for electrification based on the fair base. We believe that actually if you model properly what cities will be like, once a proper deployment of Euro 6 has happened, then the incremental improvement of the electric vehicle is very, very small or immeasurable. And then you're left with actually the challenge of particulates from the vehicle that are non-exhaust. But a full implementation of Euro 6, the particulate emissions of the vehicle are independent of the powertrain. It is tires and brakes. And so it's pretty similar actually between, a, between an electric and a, and a, and a hybrid or, or, or diesel vehicle for that matter. There's a lot more that needs to be told and developed and one of the ambitions or one of the objectives of the previous association in Concarva actually is to inform that better. You have put the focus on the electric vehicle. 
even the promotion of the gas by the European Commission in the blue corridors and other measures, don't you see that gas in transport is uh, really a threat to the demand of uh, oil and petroleum products? And the second question is that given that the penetration of electric vehicle at present is rather low in the area of Europe and yes. in Spain also, uh, the, the retirement of the refinery capacity that is in Europe that has been put in one of your first slides. Uh, could you expound about the reasons of that? Uh, why so many refineries are closing in Europe? Right. Okay, I'll come, here, so I'll, come, I'll come back to that first. So the future of natural gas in vehicles. Natural gas is a lower carbon fuel and when it replaces gasoline, it does give some significant greenhouse gas saving on one condition that you really have no leakage to atmosphere. Methane slip is sometimes called. Methane is a powerful greenhouse gas on its own. One of the NGOs in, in Brussels, Transport and Environment, recently commissioned work by Ricardo to look at this. And Ricardo's conclusion is, yes, it produces greenhouse gas savings, but any reasonable, any, any normal level of methane leakage cancels out that gain. We do think that it has some applications in, likely in heavy duty trucks, where you can spend money on very high quality infrastructure, have trained technicians and people to manage the system overall, and can have some greenhouse gas savings. It is happening to some extent in the US, LNG or CNG for trucks, um, in particular focusing some of the big sort of cross-continent uh, routes for the, for the heavy duty trucks. Our own view is that it's probably not a solution for cars, but does make sense for some substitution of diesel. <coughs> it, um, it, the other factor against it for passenger cars is that we have a track record of experience with customers with gaseous fuels, LPG. It's okay, sort of semi-gaseous. It's not very popular, <coughs> despite the fact that in many countries it's half the price or a third of the price for the consumer. For some reason, consumers don't like gaseous fuel. They find the refueling clunky. Um, some of the suppliers don't like or have difficulties with HSE requirements in different places. Uh, CNG has been on the market in Germany and several countries in Italy uh, and still remains not very popular. Um, I'm not a marketing expert and we, can't, we don't actually have a great explanation for why that is. But there's not much enthusiasm, I think, in the downstream industry for CNG as a personal transport fuel because of that experience with customers. Um, we know the truck makers are working on it and offer products. Um, the key enabler actually would be a, a lower gas price in Europe. In the US, we have a gas price that is well, less than half of the European price, and, uh, and that helps them to keep the economic to work. So, your last point about why so many refinery closures, uh, well, a number of reasons. Um, the dieselization of the European fleet uh, meant that many refineries that had a, of a more simple configuration that had naturally got a, a higher gasoline yield than diesel found that their margins were very poor because the margin was really more in the diesel production. And they were struggling to be economic. The only way they could be economic was to get a good price for export gasoline, and uh, that has been very challenging for them. Um, and let's be clear as well, Europe also has had some older refineries, uh, sometimes not well located. And in some cases, uh, for, you know, just to be clear, for, some, for companies that have disappeared, in some cases maybe not well managed either. And there's been some natural attrition. Uh, we've had fuel economy in the fleet making real progress, so the declining domestic demand has also been one of those factors. Thank you. Okay. Well, continuing with, with this question, you know, it may, uh, well, you were focusing quite a lot on the trucks and so on, but also uh, taking a look at, at the cities, at the pollution of the cities and so on, just uh, regarding um, the, the, the pollution capacity of the diesel against the, the gas vehicle is quite, it's quite different, especially uh, that's not uh, because of the, the emission, the CO2 emission, but because of particles and all that. But it is really the, the 
market distortions because of travel in the city. Do you, do you see that, as you showed the graph, that there's, there's different alternatives to, to put solutions to, uh, to put real solutions to these problems? It's like uh, going from, from one street, sorry, one street to the other, like very expensive uh, electricity vehicles to uh, low price diesel. Do you see that this could be really a solution for, for cities like Madrid or, or any other city that's developing? And you know, you can take into account that in, in cities like Madrid there are also uh, just buses running on, on this technology that in, in the, in the network could really easily develop. Mm -hmm. you see that? Mm -hmm. Gas is a good thing. Um, and, uh, I, 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 mean, I, I think it has further potential. I think it needs to be used very carefully and in fleets where you have a small number of fueling stations. I don't think we're going to get to a network of gas refueling stations, CNG or LNG, like we have petrol liquid stations. Uh, there's a, a, a lot of infrastructure cost there. But for urban buses, it makes a lot of sense. It works very well. The only caution I'd say is that actually diesel exhaust after treatment is, has really caught up. Still has some further to go. But um, the, st yeah, the study that, that, that broke the news on the Volkswagen scandal, the piece that people missed there was that in the fleet of five vehicles, one of which was a Volkswagen group, was found out, shall we say. There was, always a, there was a, also a vehicle there. It was a BMW X5. Basically fully met all the requirements of, of the regulation. Euro 6 with real driving emissions and a better drive cycle is an incredibly tough set of regulations. Uh, I personally have a Euro 6 vehicle that was introduced just before the new drive cycle and everything is coming in. Um, I park it in an apartment in Brussels with an underground garage and I have to drive through this quite a large underground garage. After a year, I have never smelt the vehicle at all. And you started it from car, it was quite incredible. The diesel technology is catching up, it's almost there. With the and I'm encouraging the car industry to go to that extra stage and get it to that incredible level of performance. Um, then, you know, let's, let's have sensible, but I mean, really, really uh, tough air quality emissions for vehicles, and then have a technology neutral approach to how do you meet that. If you can meet it with diesel, fine. If you can't, gas will certainly, you know, compete better than electricity too. So, you know, this is not about favouring more technology, it's about let's be clear about the objectives and clear about the economics. Mm -hmm. okay. We have a couple of questions. Huh? Before asking my question, let me, let me just uh, add something that, uh, uh, something we just uh, put aside when talking about the contribution of every fuel in the air quality of uh, big urban areas, which is that new vehicles, ever since vehicles being fueled with gasoline as the exact limit of emissions for both you know, X and particulate matters and those being fueled with uh, natural gas. As a matter of fact, most of them are be fuel vehicles. So um, we, we should compare the uh, same technology and same kind of cars when we do this kind of comparisons and this kind of conclusion about the contribution of every fuel for the air quality of uh, big cities. Anyhow, my, my question was uh, just for the sake of the days. Uh, I'd like to go a little bit further than the downstream activities of the oil industry and the oil industry as a whole. And uh, how could we just uh, play a role in this energy transition debate we are having just uh, worldwide? Uh, we have been deemed so many times as not been uh, committed enough as an oil industry in the decarbonization of the economy. And this uh, uh, subject, this debate, uh, seems to have two approaches of the both sides of the Atlantic Basin mm. uh, uh, for those companies in the States uh, mm. from, the, from our industry which uh, uh, seem to be willing to get stick mm. to what they say they are good at which is uh, producing and refining oil in order to produce oil by products mm. and transport and uh, electrical industry mm. and maybe this uh, side of the uh, basin uh, where we have several companies that have decided to step into renewables in order to show a bigger commitment in order to contribute for those, uh, for that energy transition. 
Uh, what's your view on that, uh, John? Uh, well, what's uh, our uh, the, the real role we can play as an industry in this uh, big debate uh, about energy transition? That's a really good question. Um, maybe quite a lot of what I've said so far sounds defensive. Uh, I think I'd just like to recast it a little. There's a point about having really clear ideas of what we spend on different uh, technologies. That is mostly a conversation about big scale deployment of solutions. And where society is spending a lot of money, and let's be clear, we will spend a lot of money. This is about having good performance indicators for what we spend in the big policy objective. We ought to, as a society, treat this as an enormous business project. And it is a huge business project to transform the economy to a lower carbon economy. You should have a value indicator there, and that's the cost you spend on, on carbon. But we also need to be developing technologies more than we're doing today, I believe. And part of the problem with having a mandated system rather than a carbon price system is that it's politicians that pick which ones get developed rather than the market. Um, 100 euros for a tonne of carbon is not enough to support most technologies and actually it's one of the points in policy that we're pushing around and developing the idea that really we ought to be supporting technology more strongly in Europe to find the solutions to get us there. And let's just say a few words about the liquid fuel. Um, we spend a lot of time on energy working, battery developments, and there are some encouraging signs of electrification. <coughs> battery technology costs are coming down. We spend most of our money on biofuel in Europe doing crop-based biofuels. Advanced biofuel still looks tough, but at the moment the system works on the basis of you build a plant and then you have to monetize it through a mandate which might last two years, five years or something like that. And yes, it creates a reasonable price signal, but there's no long-term signal at all. And actually, you've still got to monetize it through deployment. I believe we've got to work hard, and both as an industry and also as whether it's a centralized technology program or something. I think we've got to work hard to find ways to decarbonize liquid fuels. Because it's very clear, what, however the competition goes with electrification, a lot of society will need liquid fuels. And we know for sure that aviation will, and heavy duty probably, and marine probably. I think we've got to work hard to look at every possible idea identify more technologies in that area. Uh, the CCS option is a possibility. Other ways to get sites, industrial sites, down to very, very low carbon or even zero emissions. Aggressive, and I think we should look at that. And if you start with the starting point that already we've rationalized in society spending 200 euros a ton on biofuels, or taxing our products at 300 euros a ton, we should not dismiss things that are that order of range. We should find policy solutions to help make it work, but we should look at more ambitious solutions. I also think we should be looking harder at different ways to do lower carbon liquids, whether that's a bio route or whether there are other ways. Power to liquids, green hydrogen. You feed, you feed, you feed your hydrogen with green hydrogen, you've immediately got a portion of green energy in the in the, in the product, even though it's chemically identical to uh, when you were using fossil fuels. I believe we should look at every option. And uh, I'm proposing that we have that conversation with regulators. If we do that, the car makers should also get some benefit of that reduction in the way that that translates into their own compliance. I believe that the oil industry needs to develop a vision of how we stepwise reduce our carbon intensity of our product as a liquid. And we have to be open-minded, we have to be brave, um, and we will have to take some risk in that conversation. I think we have to have something to compete with the offer of whole-scale electrification, cost no object, that is currently the vision that is being put out there. And uh, I encourage those of us in the oil industry to really think hard about what we can bring forward as a vision for the liquid portion of the the economy of the transport world in, in the future.
Last question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Check on yeah. I read a, a newsletter from several weeks ago, and I like to, your opinion on the impact of the uh, refining strategy for future. Norway looks uh, set the, to become the first country <coughs> to ban the sale of cars based on uh, fossil fuel. Uh, it's a strong measure, very hard. Uh, politicians believe that uh, all the vehicles must be run on green energy, mm -hmm. all the concept green energy. When we uh, analyze the past um, here in Spain, uh, the diesel evolution market share changed the position of the refining. Uh, you, you explained mm -hmm. perfectly the blues. But uh, what do you consider that they could be the mix for all the fuels and alternative fuels and uh, who impact uh, in your uh, vision on refining industry? Um, so, this is more thinking out loud, right, than analysis. Uh, I believe that we'll see some countries move forward with continued strong support for electrification. Norway is a wealthy country. There's an absurd irony from the fact that it's wealthy because of huge oil wealth. Uh, but it has its choices. It's also, it's also wealthy in a different way with electricity with its hydrogen, of course. And you can make a case to say, yes, it makes sense that way. Um, I personally doubt that much will change their minds. There's a certain attractiveness. It's a beautiful country with natural, you know, stunning natural beauty. I think the, the moral case, if you like, for operating an electric car in that environment is that there's something appealing about it. And Norway as a country that can afford to go that way. It's got a very small population. Um, they still will actually be spending, relatively speaking, a lot per tonne of carbon relative to if they had, you know, just take an academic case, if they uh, not put in place those incentives and they'd gone to an Indian power station and say, how about we pay you to do efficiency first? And then when you've done all the efficiency you can, well, you could either switch to gas or you could do CCS. It would still be a fraction of the cost of what all things do. So we should sometimes be able to dissect what is a moral case and what is an economic case. And we tend to go quite strongly for the moral case in Europe. And then the other defense for the moral case is that the economic case is politically too difficult. I would agree it's really difficult. But at least part of this conversation is to say you at least need a clear view of what's the best you can achieve economically. And that's Throwing down the gauntlet, the American English expression, you throw down the challenge to the to the policymakers to say that's what we can do. How close can we get to that? Rather than just be told we should do this, it's the right thing to do. Um, I look. I expect some countries will will continue. Netherlands is looking like it will go some way that way. Uh, there is some pushback in the Netherlands from the cost angle. One of the observations from their, their early work, and this is something I, I spoke to in the, in the Netherlands ministry recently, they observed that the incentives tended to go to people that were the wealthier end of the spectrum. And the people that relied on cars that were buying, you know, second hand cars that were older couldn't enjoy the benefits of the subsidies. And they saw some social imbalance in that. And so they're saying they need to rethink. I do think the Netherlands will continue to promote electrification. What does it mean for the refining industry overall? I think we need to think strategically actually about the product mix. And we need to have some tough conversations with the motor industry. It makes a lot of sense to have a use for gasoline in Europe. And arguably, you know, if you think of all the, all the diesel vehicles, light duty diesel vehicles in cities, why are they only available as diesels? Actually now, we've got the cleanliness and the efficiency of the gasoline engine better. Maybe those should be gasoline hybrids. You know? And I think we need to have a tough conversation with both the regulators and the car industry to say, look, we have this natural resource, the whole world will be using it. You know, if it's 50, 60 dollars a barrel, you can guarantee the rest of the world are going to be using it and we'll have competitive economies or that health and health in the competitive economy. We also need to find responsible, efficient ways to use it and to use that means responsibly using the whole barrel. So I think we need to have a tough conversation around balancing the demands as well. That would be a proactive industry rather than one that just
just sits back and reacts after somebody else does something. What are we doing, Tom? I'm fine to carry on. Not the minor issue is that Norwegians have, have not a single carbon factor in the country. <laughs> I like the hydrate solution. It's, a, it's really a good idea. And going back again, sorry for going all the time to gas. It's not that I have a gas car, I have a diesel car, and I like it a lot. But you know, I would like to, to have the possibility of keeping that car. And you know, the, the engine could be the same. And, and, and what if you have the possibility of running that car on diesel? or gas in a moment. And for example, maybe you could be only allowed to go into the city driving it on gas. Just avoid these periods because, you know, I don't know that if you know that in Madrid in a certain period of time, especially when there's uh, no wind and it's really cold, it's, it's really uh, congested and it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a problem, no? So with one of those solutions, that's combining uh, hybrids, yeah. it could be a blind hybrid possibility, you know, yeah. possibility to, use to allow people <coughs> in the cities, only the people who can drive yeah. in those spaces. Yeah. That can be an idea. One of the things we haven't even talked about, and that is the digitalization of car and it's a very big agenda for the automotive industry and the transport regulation world as well. And there are, on the one hand, there are hopes that uh, autonomous vehicles and greater digital control of vehicles will deliver efficiency. And that's part of the plan, actually, of the European Commission to meet objectives through more efficient driving, more better control of congestion, optimization of logistics for trucking, etc. The whole digitalization thing. And this kind of cuts straight across all of these different issues. And there is an active debate as to A, whether it can make real savings or whether it drives demand. Because what do you do when you make things more efficient? You bring the cost down. If you can use a 40, I don't know what the weight limit is in Spain, and in the UK, we have 44 ton trucks. Um, if you've got a 40 or 44 or 42 ton, 44 ton truck, right now the usability of that truck is limited by how many hours the driver can drive. And then also limits on whether you can do a return journey across Europe. Well, if you break those two, then you can use a truck for 23 hours a day, as opposed to maybe the 8 or 12 that you use. Or well, you've just halved the capital cost, right? And some of the operating costs. Um, if you can reduce congestion by reducing the distance between trucks from 50 meters to 2 meters, which is what truck platooning will do, then you've just improved journey times. Um, if you're platooning your trucks and you've got one driver for 20 vehicles, you've just reduced your labor cost. Right? So there is a danger that some of this agenda drives demand as well. So this is the other thing that cuts right across this. The Commission are hoping to drive down demand as part of their, uh, um, their uh, task of decarbonizing transport. The technology might take it the other way. And that's probably the subject for another conversation. I just need to put that in the room. You know, it's not planned on so Transport policy is, is multifaceted. There's no more questions. It's time to finish. Thank you very much to John for his very good presentation. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As you know, the objective of our Center Seasonal Center is to create a milieu for dialogue and debate among those invited. Um, ending by Chatham Houser. Today we have uh, had the honor of listening to contributions and reflections from the Director General of Transport Europe. One of the greatest challenges for the energy sector is to meet 
the maps of European Union climate policy. The key question is how to balance environmental and competitiveness objectives. Being realistic about reaching this objective will require a broadening of the current focus. First, I think it's clear we have a consensus among companies and academics that R&D and technological innovation are the rich key to achieving climate change mitigation. And that involves a policy not exclusive. It should be inclusive for all technologies and focus on R&D and innovation with specific tools to get decisions. Second, also at the same time, it is, a, it is paramount to look for realistic solutions to obtain complementary benefits for and from all technologies. Third, the revision of ETS mobile design is another a common decision. We see today this problem and we still remember in our last meeting, the 4th of November, we had also about this question. And a lot of the speakers uh, are in the same position to present today. First, the, this, uh, the, uh, this model is, uh, I think, necessary to improve. And four, the European climate policy should be compatible with industrial competitiveness. That is, I think, uh, another niche, niche key point. The presentation for uh, for Mr. Cooper has helped us to broaden our understanding and his oldest contributions should reach the ears of the European Union. <laughs> Thanks to all for coming and for listening to questions. And thank you, thank you very much to FEMSA, especially to Pedro Mino and him of the Spada. You are working with us as a member of the Executive Committee in Fonsea. And thank you for hosting today in this event. And thank you again very much, Mr. Cooper, for accepting our invitation and for your contributions. A great pleasure.